It's about 7.30. I think we're going to get started. And as those uh, other people start to roll in, that's fine. And just so everybody knows, we have everyone on, on mute. And if you have any questions at all, please feel free to type them in the chat box. And I'll kind of let Thatcher know that the questions are coming in. And he'll kind of talk as we go. And feel free to ask questions uh, throughout the presentation. Or if you want to wait until the end for the question and answer section, that's fine too. And so what I'm going to do is just give a, a little introduction about Thatcher. And so he's been working um, for several multi-humanitarian aid and non-governmental and developmental organizations since 1997. And in short, what happens, and Thatcher, please feel free to correct me if I'm wrong. I is, will indeed. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> is um, these organizations will call him and say, you know, are you available to go um, take photographs, uh, you know, in such and such area. And typically what he does is, you know, he'll go online and research the area and see what's going on and get a better feel for what that organization might be looking for in terms of photographs and what they need. And then those photographs are showed to people who um, have the ability to actually make change within that section. For example, um, when the tsunami hit, Thatch was able to go over there and uh, take pictures from them, and those pictures were used at several different organizations in order to help raise money and help those who are really in need. Um, his most notable body of work, in my opinion, are the photographs that he took while he was in Kyrgyzstan. He was awarded a Fulbright scholarship and went to Kyrgyzstan to document the lifestyle of this country that was really recovering from the downfall of the Soviet Union. And so those are some of the images that we're going to see today and Thatcher's going to give you a nice presentation on um, not just his body of work but how he uh, views the world and how he can really see photographs making a difference and creating more of a social change and how he really connects with people in these photographs. So Thanks. that's, you know, the platform is yours. Well, thank you very much, Melanie. Um, just like Melanie had said, I work for NGOs, non-governmental organizations, and they hire me to document their programs. So the budget for the programs comes out of something called RD, Resource Development. And that can be resource development from the web team, you know, the, the folks that um, try and stimulate donorship from on you know online from sources uh, where people send in money after a disaster or it can come from the end report um, budget which is um, something here's an end report picture right here um, which is what I used to um, which is what I used to um, get my budget from was in reports um, with the advent of digital photography what's happened is a lot of um, a lot of NGOs are now just using their local staff to photograph and then they upload the, the photographs from the field and what I do is I'm hired not only to do assignments for NGOs but also um, to teach their local staff and different staff members around the world to uh, make better photographs. So my income used to be 100% from assignment work like this annual report for the International Rescue Committee, I'm just looking at it now, it's 2003, so it's 10 years old. Um, and then, now what I do is I do some assignment work, but also I get hired as a consultant to build the capacity of the, the local staff. Um, I've been doing this for a very long time, and I actually enjoy teaching as much as I do doing assignment work. So. Um, I want to make sure that this is as beneficial to everyone as possible, and I encourage you all to ask questions by typing. Um, let me know if there's any uh, technical questions you have. Um, I think this slideshow pretty much everything was shot on film. I shoot digitally now, but uh, oh, there's a one project from China at the end that was shot digitally. But these are um, some images that I've taken over the years. And again, um, Mary just said, you're all muted, so <clears throat> you're going to have to type your questions in. Um, this is June 11th, 1983. This is my 12th birthday, and this is me getting my first camera. Um, this is the most important moment of my life. Um, and 
I'm so glad that it was documented. And I think sometimes, especially when we're students, we, we think we hold photography in this really high regard. Um, I certainly do. But I also want us to remember that photography is very utilitarian. Um, there's, it's got purposes beyond art. Um, a good example is my wife is a wedding photographer and she photographs weddings and she does it all over all over the planet and um, those photographs she makes often have a longer shelf life than the photographs I make. Um, they're, they're photographs that are used as an heirloom that are passed down from generation to generation so as we go along I think that it's important that we we just remember to always make photographs. Um, my first photography project was uh, the circus. I asked my father if he'd drive me to the circus and he agreed to. Um, this was when I was, was only 12 and uh, I had him get up really early about 5 in the morning and he dropped me off in the circus and I spent the day with the circus workers and it was a, it was a marvelous day. It was one of the best days of my life. I had, I think, three rolls of film, and I, I stayed the entire day. And I have a print of this image that I that I shot when I was 12 as a reminder of that day. And um, I teach workshops in photography at the Maine, media workshops in Maine, and I still um, go and visit the same circus um, in the summer if it's around. I've been able to the last three summers. And... Um, and photograph. It's just a wonderful environment. But I didn't even realize it um, when I was doing it, but I was photographing a, um, a marginalized population that's on the move, you know, living in tents, transient population. So um, after, after high school, I went to college and I studied um, photography. And, and then after that, I got a job at a still life studio and I photographed collectible dolls and this drove me nuts. I worked there two years and nine months and we would photograph <coughs> dolls on 8 by 10 film. It would take two and a half days to take a single picture of a doll. It was all about the styling of the fabric and it drove me nuts. It was the most uninspired work I could think of. But what I did do was I learned a lot about lighting. I learned a lot about um, the technical aspects of photography and I was also able to um, save some money and I saved literally saved pennies to go and give myself a little self-financed uh, project I decided to go to Bulgaria and photograph gypsies and um, I got off the train in Bulgaria and I, I encourage you to ask questions as um, as slides appear on the screen because um, I'm not able to look at your faces and know know that you're 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 being inquisitive <laughs> or even if you're awake um, well in Bulgaria I got off the I took a bus to a small village and I had this little torn piece of paper I still have it with the name and address of the family on it and when I got to that village they sent me to another bus, and I rode that bus to the end, and that bus left only um, once, uh, twice a week. And I got off the bus, and this little girl here, her name is Rumyana, said that, that that piece of paper I had was her family. And she showed me around her village, which was called Ribnava. And here, um, this is a Pomak population. The, the Pomak roughly translates um, from, from Bulgarian to tormented or tortured and um, they're a Muslim minority that weren't allowed to go to Turkey because of the Soviet and communist influence in Bulgaria um, but she showed me around the village and she showed me so many wonderful things um, she was a great teacher instead of bringing me to their mosque she brought me to a place where the brick makers were making bricks to build a mosque and um, what I learned from her was that things that are visually interesting are also very interesting to a child. So what I do, um, and I'll, I'll answer your question, Danielle, in a second. What I do is um, when I'm out photographing, I always try to think like a child because they're very visual. 
they don't have the baggage of of um, the historical context of the mosque or or anything like that. What gave you the idea to go to Bulgaria, where the gypsy is an inspiration from something in particular? Um, I was originally going to go to Chechnya and photograph refugees there. I had made a lot of contacts, but it seemed like it would be too dangerous to go. And the more research I did, the more um, Bulgaria seemed like a, a great um, destination. I had a lot of access there. Um, this is a photograph I made in in uh, so Sofia, Bulgaria, the capital. This is just outside of Sofia in a neighborhood called Fakultet. And, and um, any of you wanting to get into photojournalism to sort of answer Daniel's question a little bit more in depth, any of you want to get more into photojournalism, I would highly recommend that you don't go to places where there's an act of war going on or a big news event because you're going to be competing with folks from CNN and Time and Newsweek and Magnum and all, all of that and they're going to have the budgets that you don't have. So for me what I do is I do go to those big events but I also enjoy spending time in a village with a family. Um, my assignments are not about war as much as they are about people affected by war, economic upheaval. So I'll go and photograph a family that had a bakery, that has a bakery in, we'll say, Indonesia. And they'll borrow $500 from a microcredit initiative and they'll double the size of their bakery. And I photograph how that extra $500 that they've borrowed and paid back has impacted their family. So I'll, I'll, I'll do a ethnographic, anthropological sort of um, documentary on on this family and and how how they live day to day and I try to extract extract in my images sort of universal things like a child getting sent off to school or um, a marriage or you, you know diff, different roles that the family plays that we can all relate to anyway this is a photograph made in a gypsy ghetto called Fakultet outside of Sofia Bulgaria and um, one of the things I always try to photograph is home. I ask myself, what is home? And here um, they made this car, this old Lada Zhuguli car from Russia, into a bedroom. So it's interesting. I think conceptually, and I'll talk a little bit more about that too. This is my Bulgarian grandparents, my Romanian, my <laughs> gypsy grandparents. That's um, Roman on the left. He's hiding a bottle behind his back. And this is the family that I stayed with. And Roman and um, the woman to his left, our right, is uh, Dora. So Roman and Dora are gypsies. Um, and I thought that it was appropriate to call gypsies Roma. But Roman said, you're a member of our family now. And the entrance into becoming a member of his family involved um, drinking a lot of what was in the bottle behind him <laughs> as he's holding it here. Um, but also he said that gypsy should be a, a word to be proud of. Um, it shouldn't be, it shouldn't be um, a bad word. So use the word gypsy as much as possible um, when, you're, when you're speaking about us. So I took that to heart and I, um, you know, so I use the word gypsy knowing full well um, that most people prefer Roma, but um, but I'm doing that in honor of a Roman, my uh, my gypsy, my gypsy grandfather. Um, this is a gypsy couple in um, a little town in Bulgaria called Velengrad. Um, she's 14 years old. He's in his 30s. Um, obviously, people get married younger, but it's not my my job to judge. Um, I do have a story. I um, I was talking to a woman um, and she handed me her baby and I said, oh, you have a wonderful little baby. Is this your daughter? And she said, no, no, it's my granddaughter. And um, it turned out that she was a she was a 28-year-old grandmother. Um, 
in, there's a question about how to make how do I make contact with people when I first show up. Well, um, when I travel independently, I do a lot of research. So, um, and when I first started, there wasn't any any you know internet per se. It was just getting started in '97. Um, but <clears throat> research, research, research. Um, I work a lot with non-governmental organizations to do outreach programs to these vulnerable populations. So um, I just just do whatever I can. Um, language, I speak Russian, but um, NGOs provide me with an interpreter and a driver. And if we had more time, I'd be happy to talk to you um, about um, the fact that language is not as big a barrier as one would think. Um, in fact, it's kind of makes it a level democratic playing field because um, the person you're photographing can't communicate with you, so they're going to go about what they're doing, and you're going to disappear. And then when you both try to communicate with each other, you're both working towards something together, um, which is which is really terrific. It's a terrific way to build rapport. This is a photograph I made in an orphanage in Tbilisi, Georgia, and this girl's name is Sofa, and her mother is a um, or was maybe still is a prostitute at the um, the train station and, and I asked Sofa I said do you ever want to go home and she said what do you mean this is my home and um, I one of the things that we struggle with in NGOs is what are success indicators what are things that how do we know that we're being the, the work that's being done is successful and quotes like that um, from a from an orphanage where the, the the orphan feels the orphanage is, is her home is a good success indicator because NGOs don't have a bottom line like um, amount of money that they've made in a in a in a year or in a quarter. This is um, a house blessing in Georgia, and I like to use mixed light. So it was in the morning, and um, there's a little bit of shady light coming in from the window, and then these women held these candles as the priest blessed a house and the candles illuminated their their faces. Um, this is in Azerbaijan in the South Caucasus. One of the things I try to photograph is public art um, when I'm in the Soviet Union because it's it's really kind of funky. It's, it's usually made by a committee of engineers and a lot of cement. <laughs> so um, so, and this is um, Azerbaijan has has an interesting is an interesting situation because um, one fifth of the entire population, twenty percent of the entire population, has been displaced by war. So they're living as refugees within the confines of their own country because the border with Armenia moved into Azerbaijan. So this boy used to bring his sheep down in the winter when he couldn't be up in the mountains, but then the mountains no longer belonged to Azerbaijan, so he's left um, with his flock um, all year round, and um, folks live in these railroad cars, and this this girl with on the red, thank you Stephen, um, this girl with the red socks, um, this is this is inside a box car, so um, I was uh, I was sitting inside the boxcar having tea with this girl's um, grandfather, and she was making the tea. And these boxcars become very hot in the summer and very cold in the winter. But it's the only sort of form of um, uh, shelter that they have. And again, it's me trying to photograph um, what is home, that concept of home. And I just I waited for her to look into the light, and I saw the shadow on the right of her. Um, and I love the fact that she wore those red socks. <laughs> these two women um, did a lot. The, they're they're um, standing in between these um, old boxcars that now have stairs leading up to them. And uh, they did a lot for the refugees um, that were living that are living in Azerbaijan. And I I um, photographed them with a really long lens, a 300 millimeter lens. And I had a, a bank light up to their right. And um, one thing I do when I photograph people is I, 
I get close to them and I sort of adjust their shirt and then I say okay and I make an okay sign and um, and then I go back to my tripod if I'm on a tripod which I was here and I'll photograph and my assistant Ramil said oh, Thatcher we need to talk when I was photographing this and there's about I'd say between 60 40 and 60 people kind of gathered around watching me photograph these two women and I said, Ramil, can it, can it wait? And he said, no, it's pretty important. And I said, well, what is it? And he said, well, when you make the OK sign, you're actually flipping them off. It's like sticking your middle finger up at someone in America. And I had no idea I was doing this. And um, when you know that story behind the, uh, the picture, their faces take on new meaning. You know, at first, you just sort of look at them. But when you hear that story, it's kind of like, he seems like a nice guy. Why do you think he's flipping us off? I don't know. Just just bear with me. <laughs> Anyways, thanks, Stephen, for saying that was funny because I, I can't hear if anybody's laughing. <laughs> thanks, Mel. <laughs> um, this is in Tajikistan, which is in um, the former Soviet Union. It's down on the um, Afghan border. And it's just... It's really mountainous. Two of the ten highest peaks in the world are in the Pamir Mountains of Tajikistan, Mount Communism and Mount Karl Marx. And um, when I made this picture, I was staying with a family that had 16 children, and I got up early to go go outside and and uh, and use the bathroom, use the field, and um, this is what I saw. And there's hardly any arable land. There's hardly any farmland. And um, it's 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 really probably one of the most remote places I've been to. I lived in Tajikistan for a year. This is um, dead goat polo. This is if you can see my cursor. This this is a goat carcass, and it's called buskashi. And they they bring these dead goats up around a um, a goalpost and back, and you get points. And it's kind of like any goal sport, you know, soccer. Or, or uh, football or anything like that. Um, and rather, this is a photograph I just made of the event. But this photograph was made on the same roll of film. And this, these are the sort of photographs you want to make at events like this. Because when you look at, back at this photograph of the, the dead goat, it's just, it's just information. It's not very good information. It's not organized very well. It's just me trying to document something. But here, you get the whole mood of it. You get the, the whole mood of the, the event, and that's what makes it so special. Um, this, is, uh, this is a photograph I made on my way back from, when I was living in Tajikistan, I had an assignment in Mongolia, and I had to get my film processed in Moscow. To get from Dushanbe, Tajikistan, you have to have a four-day layover in Moscow. And then, and then off to Olam Batar. So when I was coming back from Mos from uh, Olam Batar in Mongolia, I was staying at a hotel and I had a terrible, terrible flu. And um, what had happened was, I was staying in the hotel and drinking a lot of Nyquil and um, orange juice. And this was m me taking my camera on the way to the pharmacist to get some some more medicine and I was crossing a bridge and I saw him saw him there and snapped this picture and I don't know if you can see it or not but there's a sunset behind him and and I think it's important to make the sunset just a part of the picture rather than the entire picture um, this is in Uganda this is a boxing gym and I walked in um, thanks Ellen thanks yeah the depth of field makes the 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 um, sun the pink and the sunset more creamy and milky. Um, this is a boxing gym in Kampala, Uganda. Um, and I walked into the I walked into the gym and I asked if I could make a make photographs and they said sure. So I could have either gone left or right. And when I went right, I ended up in the shower room. So this was in the shower room and off to the left in the frame, you can see water splashing down on a boxer. This is that same boxing gym and this is a woman, um, this is the woman who would clean up the the blood and cook the meals of the boxers. Um, 
and there's just this red wall. And the light in there is just gorgeous. Um, photograph a lot of HIV AIDS. This is AIDS in, in Uganda. I've been to Uganda um, more than anywhere else on assignment. Um, I think I've been there 13 times. I could do a full long slideshow on Uganda. This is an old cassava factory that um, is being turned into a refugee camp. So these people are, were arriving when I was there. And these are, um, these are refugees that have found wood and have built structures and they're just waiting for plastic sheeting from the United Nations or from the Red Cross. So it's like a whole little village, a skeleton of a village. Um, huge, huge displacement um, in the north of Uganda because of the LRA, the Lord's um, Resistance Army. And what it is is it's this guy, Joseph Kony, who takes, he, um, um, he takes, he kidnaps children and um, makes them either into wives, which is a sex slave, or into, um, in, or, or their boys into um, fighters. I mean, I, I talked to a, a young boy named Philip who's 12 years old who had to execute his parents. Um, otherwise, he would have been killed. This is um, malaria in Uganda, and um, this is a this is um, a family that lives in an old boxcar. Again, that sense of home, and that sense of home in that last slide too. Home is such an important thing to photograph. It's a, it's a concept. It's not just a place. This is a photograph in Niger in West Africa, and I put this in here because I wanted to let you know a little bit about technique. I shot this with a 35 millimeter lens and um, he was only a few, and it was not cropped, he was only a few feet from me. But what I do is I hold the camera up to my face and I let my subject walk through the frame and then I, and then I snap away and they don't even know it. It's a neat technique. Um, this is, um, thanks Stephen for the the compliment. You guys are great giving me all these compliments. This is, um, I always photograph, this is Casablanca. And this is on, um, in Morocco, where, and I was in Morocco actually last week for another reason. Um, and this is uh, me wandering the streets with my camera on a layover. I had an 18 hour layover in Morocco. And, um, and I wandered around and made photographs. This is the river uh, Ganges in India. Um, this is very, very early in the morning. Um, a lot of activity happens on the, on the Ganges, and this is a, a man um, praying in the water. Um, it's interesting because I walk down there, and it, it's such a congested place, but this early in the morning it wasn't. And, um, but I saw people washing laundry, and I actually saw my own clothes being washed from the, from the hotel I was staying at. Um, this is uh, a place where they make saris in India, and uh, and this is just a sort of me thinking conceptually. You know, where do these saris come from? I asked our driver, and he brought us to this place, and it was just beautiful, beautiful light and wind just kind of passing through this fabric, this fabric that was two stories, sometimes three stories high, and just this wind going through. And the light is really beautiful. But that's the thing that I do is I, I think like where is something from? You know, I photograph a lot in Istanbul lately and, and there's these little boys that walk around with trays of um, trays of tea that they give to different vendors and markets. And I just follow one of the you know one of the boys back to where they get the tea, the origin of the tea. And um, <clears throat> And then, and then I'm in this environment where there's all these people moving around making tea, and it's a really gritty environment. Environment is really, really strong. It's really important to photographs. Um, this is a photograph I made in um, Aztec, New Mexico. And the, the man here, um, I was photographing the, just the sunset and his, this, this auto garage, and he... Um, he asked me not to take his photograph after I took this, and um, but he invited me in, and I met his wife, who was 15 years old, and their little baby, 
and then um, he had only one eye. He had he they had a a um, wood stove, and he put a bottle of spray paint on it, and it knocked his eye out. And um, he took me up. We had a little ladder on the side, and he took me up on the top of the building to watch the sunset over the A and W fast food restaurant. But this is mixed light sources, so that you have this green light from the fluorescent, and then you have the pink light from the sunset. And that's really, really um, a wonderful way of making an uninteresting building interesting. I like to photograph architecture with mixed light sources. Um, another thing I photograph a lot of is bus stations. I love photographing people figuring out, um, figuring stuff out. <laughs> so I go to a bus station and I see a pile of chickens, a lot of baggage, some cardboard, and 30 people. And they have to get all of that on the bus and out of there. So I just stand back and I photograph. And I just photograph all the, the activity. And it's I have a list of photographs that I make if I get to some place early. And I'll show you that list um, later on in this uh, presentation. Also, um, you know, my, my email address is thatcher at thatchercook.com and you're welcome to email me if you have any questions. Um, like I said, I'm, I'm more of an educator than a photographer um, because my photography is, is there to educate as well. Thanks, Melanie, for putting that out there. Um, this is also in Eritrea. Eritrea used to be part of um, Ethiopia. It's the coast. It's the coastal part of Ethiopia. And I was having lunch on a way to an assignment. And um, this was in the place I was having lunch. Um, the reason I put this in is a couple things. One is um, that hand coming in the, the left side of the frame is a, is a real important part. Um, it's, it makes the picture bigger than the confines um, of the frame. And then the other person is reaching outside of the frame. For this PowerPoint presentation, I've cropped his hand. I just realized that now. Um, what, there was a question of how do I handle um, uh, how do I handle um, being harassed for shooting in public place? Um, I'm pretty discreet. I use small cameras, um, but it, but um, this is an, actually a situation where I was harassed. What I didn't tell you is that on the floor be below the three men sitting there is it was a man passed out, either drunk or I think he was just drunk and passed out. And um, I kind of tried to include him in the frame, and they got aggressive and said, no, 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 don't, don't, don't. So I didn't. Um, I never photograph anybody in a situation that that they wouldn't want to that I wouldn't want to be photographed in. And I don't photograph people who don't want to have their picture taken because um, you're not going to come out with any good pictures of somebody snarling at the camera. Um, I have always heard that for every 100 photographs, you may have one successful photograph. Do you tend to take a ton of photographs to, of each scene? Actually, my entire career, I only took, uh, I think, 16 rolls of film, and all of the pictures were, were just spot on terrific. <laughs> no, I shoot a lot. Um, there's some pictures. There's some pictures where I'll shoot three or four hundred pictures just to get one, one good one. Um, it's you got to shoot a lot, but more importantly is you have to find where to shoot. You have to find good environments. So I don't just go out in the street and shoot everything. I'll find a good environment like this pool hall, and then I'll shoot 50, 60 pictures, 70 pictures of this. Um, and then I might not shoot again for the, the whole day. Um, I was just in Spain and Morocco, and I shot 26 rolls of film, which is about 1,000 pictures. Let's see, 360, 360. Yeah, about 1,000 pictures, a little less than 1,000 pictures. And I shot two situations where I shot probably 500 pictures in those two situations. So half of all I shot... Um, was in just two situations. I do use rangefinder cameras, Robert. Um, I use Leica cameras, but um, I also you're welcome, Ellen. You're so polite, everyone. Um, yeah, I use the like I use Leica cameras, but it's and they are discreet and they are sharp and they are expensive. Um, but I also you know I'll 
I'll, I teach a lot of photography workshops, and I'll I'll handle somebody's you know Canon. I have Canon cameras too, um, uh, and I can I can if you don't just pick the camera up and point it in somebody's face, but if you sort of fuddle around with it, you know, kind of look a little bit bewildered by your camera, and then shoot, you know, aim the camera in a direction different than your subject, and then kind of keep the camera up to your face and then move until the frame works and your subject's in there, you can get away with a lot. Um, and I have a whole, I have a whole workshop on how to approach people. This is, um, I was, I was in uh, the Gaza Strip during an infantata, and this is uh, like a, a sort of a, a war, an active war. So um, this is me hanging out with a Palestinian mother and child um, during a, a bombing raid. So that's that. Um, I've been to Afghanistan a few times. Um, all the times I've been there have been before 911. Um, so trade cultivation. I have to move this. Trade cultivation and use of opium is strongly forbidden in Islam. This is painted on a wall. This is the main terminal at the airport in Faizabad. And what's wrong with this? Well, I bet you've guessed that it's in English. Um, and I wonder what it would be like to have somebody describe my religion to me in a foreign language in my own country. And so I, I, I photographed this wall for that very reason. And I often try to put myself in the, the shoes of the folks that I'm photographing. Oops. Next slide. And then right beyond that is opium puppy fields. There they are. Um, this is uh, this is a a scene. I was in this this little village, and the front line between the Taliban and the the resistance called the Northern Alliance was moving towards us, so all these um, refugees started started packing up and leaving, and um, and I was eating um, little dumplings, um, Afghani dumplings, and in a house, and I stepped, I looked out the window, and I saw about three hundred people right outside the window. I couldn't even hear them; they were so quiet, just moving along. This was made during that day. If I wasn't a photographer, I would probably be a motorcycle herdsman in Mongolia. <laughs> this is made on my first trip to Mongolia a long time ago. And these guys would ride around on their, their motorcycles and herd um, camels and cows. Um, this cow is, I was there during, um, as I was there, uh, thanks Stephen for the compliment. I was there um, photographing during a zood, zood, which is Mongolian for um, uh, extreme weather. So it could either be extreme hot or extreme cold. And it was 50 degrees below zero when I was there, and this cow froze um, solid. Um, this is a this is during that same trip. This is a Mongolian um, grandfather and granddaughter. Um, and those are some cows behind them. And one thing to do is, if you're doing a portrait and you want it to be a, a, a simple, easy to look at portrait, one thing to do is have the horizon go through the shoulders. This is um, a bagel factory in Mongolia. Um, it's this this bread that they have that's it's boiled and then baked like a bagel. And um, I photographed it because they had borrowed money from one of my clients and paid it back and they, they increased the size of their bakery. But I had to photograph the building that they had built and it was a very uninspired cinder block building. So I got up about four in the morning and waited for the, the sun to sort of come up. So I got some blue light and then I used the green light of the of the um, fluorescent light that was lighting that. The stairway, and it makes, like I said, it makes the the um, uh, ugly architecture more interesting. Um, I got a Fulbright grant. I'm going to talk a little bit about Kyrgyzstan. Um, I got a Fulbright grant to uh, photograph in an area called the Fergana Valley, and it's a it's an area in southern 
the former Soviet Union. Oh, there's a ding. Um, and it's this this is, I went to Kyrgyzstan, which is this little country down here. I have some, some maps for you. So this is um, Kazakhstan, which we've heard of. And then Kyrgyzstan is this little country down here. Um, I'll show you. So, so what happens is I was in Osh, and there's an Uzbek majority. So Uzbekistan is here comes in here. Tajikistan comes in here. So there's an Uzbek majority in this area. There's a Kyrgyz majority in Uzbekistan. There's a Tajik majority in Uzbekistan. And there's an Uzbek majority in Tajikistan. And the, the Uzbeks, the Tajiks, and the Kyrgyz all don't get along. So, so um, it's this area that's just sort of ripe like a tinderbox. So here's another map, and you can see the green is Tajikistan, the brown is Uzbekistan, and then the lighter brown is Kyrgyzstan, and then these little islands of land belong to Uzbekistan. So it's a, it's a very complicated part of the world. It makes it makes the Balkans or the Middle East look like New England. It's it's very very complicated. And what I did was I photographed in the Fergana Valley. Of Tajikistan, and I um, and I used this list. This is a scanned list I have of um, different things that I um, think about when I photograph. If you want a copy of this list, I have a, a book. It's a field guide, and you can you can email me, and I can s send you a copy. I think it, it's twenty dollars, but it talks all about how to approach people and, and all this other stuff. But um, but I carry this around in my wallet for years and it started to disintegrate and um, and then I and then I photographed this is um, Kyrgyzstan digitally this is in a brothel I worked in a lot of um, I worked with her outreach program for sex workers I was really interested in um, I was really interested in community in the sense of community in Kyrgyzstan um, in community and hardship I'm a big fan of Dostoevsky and he's got this the Russian writer, and he's got this um, word called sobornos, where it's community and hardship, and it sort of becomes a religion. So I photographed um, coal miners and sex workers, um, and this was obviously in color for the client, but this little baby um, who had a lot of problems was taken care of by different members of the family, and I didn't know, I didn't know who the family, meaning the different women, and I didn't know um, who the baby's actual mother was. I also photographed a Kyrgyz pop band, like the Spice Girls of Kyrgyzstan, and I was able to sort of travel around the country with them as they were on tour, and I could go backstage. But out of it became came a book called Black Apple. And the reason I call the book Black Apple is because um, I was in a town called Kokjon Gok, which translates to Black Apple. Um, and the reason it's called Black Apple is because it was a coal mining town. And I kind of liked that whole phrase, Black Apple. Um, eventually, I found out that Coke Jungkook meant um, green walnut or blue walnut. They they don't differentiate between green and blue. So I was I was off. But by that time, I had already decided that Black Apple was the the name of my project. So this is a book I published last year through Obscure Press, and it's a group of black and white photographs that I shot on film with my Leica. And this is me trying to get back to those that day at the circus with just those three. Those three rolls of film. I shot, you know, I think I shot a couple hundred rolls of film. You know, the comparison between the pomegranates and the, the slaughterhouse, and then an empty plate at a table. And then this is um this is a girl in a in a brothel. And I would work um with I would only go into the brothels with outreach workers, and I would only go out go with um outreach workers that were female. So I could so it wasn't ambiguous what my intentions were. I was there just to photograph. This is a um, a shepherd in a field. This is a view of of Osh, the city. I shot this with a panoramic camera. I shot about half the book with panoramic. Coal miner, 
or a um, gravel worker. This is in a coal mining town called Tashkumir, which means black rock. And I found this coal pile um, in this town, and um, I would it took a better part of a day to get there from where I was living. And I would I climb on the coal pile, and I would I would photograph here's some coal. I would photograph families that would pick through the coal to find little nuggets of coal, put it in a bag, and sell it. These are um, Uzbek men at a cockfight. This is a cockfight. It's a dark book, don't get me wrong. Um, these are turkeys that were sold by um, in the market. This is that same brothel where the first picture was that was in color with the little baby. This is a grandmother holding her grandchild on a very crowded minibus. Um, it, get, it would get very cold in Kyrgyzstan, and um, the Kyrgyz government sold its natural gas, a lot of its natural gas, to Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan. And uh, so people would turn on the stove to try, to try and stay warm, and they'd huddle around the stove to stay warm. This is a family that picked through coal rock. I'm almost, I'm almost done um, and ready for questions. This is a gravel pit. We have a couple little dogs in the background, if you've heard, <laughs> barking. This is uh, Tash Kumir. Again, that coal mining, the, the gravel uh, coal pile. So pictures from a brothel. Um, and this is an interesting photograph. Uh, I had access from the European Union's version of the UN. It's called the OSCE. It's the Office for Security and Cooperation in Europe. Um, they had given me, they were going to get me into, um, thanks Robert. Yeah, panoramics are really, uh, some people just see in panoramics. Um, I, I see pretty well in panoramic. Um, but I, I had access to go into a prison, and then they had taken that access away. But I really wanted to go into a prison, so um, I walked up to a prison, and I knocked on the, the door, and I said, Hello, my name is Thatcher, and uh, I'd love to take photographs inside your prison. And they said, Well, talk to the warden. So I went in and talked to the warden, and the warden was really nice, and he said, Yeah, go in and take pictures. Uh, no problem. So I was able to hang out in the prison, and... Here I was jumping through hoops to get official um, permission from the European Union, and um, I could have just talked to the warden, and he let me in. It was fantastic. Snow. This is children coal miners. There's 130 children on the side of this mountain, and each year about 130 coal miners, a lot of them children, and each year about 10 of them die, which is a very high percentage. And they take coal off the mountain with, with uh, mules. I want to get us to get to a question and answer time. Um, why do they die? Well, they they crawl into these um, they crawl into these uh, holes that have no regard for geology. So there's a lot of cave-ins, and then there's a lot of these cliff roads, these cliff paths, and the um, and there's explode, like little mini explosions, but there's these, these uh, mules will go down and they'll hog the whole path and push people off. It's extremely dangerous. Decaying animal. A farmer. This is a Muslim graveyard. This is a grandmother in a misty orchard. Now, the final thing I want to show you, and this is just a few slides. This is Hu Yan, and she, um, this is how uh, an, an NGO would hire me. They, this girl goes to a school sponsored by um, 
an NGO that I worked for. And they sent me there just before the Olympics because everybody was interested in the Olympics in Beijing. And they photographed her, a day in her life where she goes to school and she has to come home and eat lunch because she can't afford the 30 cents uh, for the meal at school. So what I did was I wanted to show how alone she was because she lived with her brother because her mother worked on the other side of town and could only come home a couple a couple nights every two months because it takes nine hours to get from one side of Beijing to the other. So I just squatted on the floor and I let her sort of move around in the space and then I waited until the bowl was up to her face and then I snapped a picture uh, when the bowl kind of filled in her, her face but I left that wall above her very blank so that you could get the sense of her being alone. And this was for Mercy Corps and this is the cover of this little um, pamphlet that, or uh, it's about the size of New York Times magazine. So this is a photograph of chalk on a chalkboard, and then this is Hu Yan, and these are the photographs I've made of her, just making lunch and being at school, hanging out with her brother, um, and then the last picture. Um, what I do try to do is I have try to have a place setter. So this is a school chair with a table, and then some kid. Some student had done um, little origami birds. So, so that's it. Any um, we have seven minutes for questions. Yeah, thanks, Mary, for opening up the. the I needed, and then oh, then this is my dog Walter. <laughs> so we can look at him while people have while people have questions. So does anyone have any questions? Yeah, I, I, I got an echo, but that's okay. Thanks, Steve. Thanks. I appreciate, I appreciate that. that. So this is when you were talking, about you moved me to unmute. Uh-oh, Um, I take PayPal. Um, just send me an email. We'll make sure you, you get you, you get one. Um, uh, it's a it's a good little field guide. Thanks, Mary. Yeah, I think it'd be great if people typed questions. How much time do you spend with your subjects before or while you're taking their pictures? Well, it depends. Um, I I um. Sometimes I can get in with a subject really quick. Other times I can't. Um, it depends. I, thank you, thank you, Doug. Um, I. It depends on the situation. I think that the most important thing, as a photographer, but also as anything that you pursue, is to really pay attention to how you interact with with the world around you and the people around you. And and when you pay attention to that, you can kind of start to read people, and you can know. You, you can kind of get a sense of boundaries and and what people will show you and share you share with you things like that. Um, I love questions, so if anybody has any other questions, please. Do you consider the printed photo story photo essay version of your work the main target, or have NGOs and other publications expressed interest in online slideshow or video versions? Great question. Um, I think that multimedia is very important. Um, I think it's, but I also think it's a trend. Um, but I think it'll always be there. The reason I think it's a trend is, um, I'll go and I do some some videos. It's kind of funny to look at Waldorf with a little dog here. <laughs> um, I do some videos for for NGOs, but um, if if an NGO hires me and I come back from a two week assignment and I give them you know thousand or fifteen hundred pictures. They can use those pictures for so many different things. And they have a library that they've built up, and they can throw those pictures into multimedia if they want to. But a video is a produced final piece with one purpose. And um, so it's good for that purpose. It's probably better than still photography. But it only has that one, one purpose, so it's not as 
uh, you can't diversify. Um, hi Thatcher, over the last year or so, what was your most inspirational moment in your subject? Wow. Well, I got married this last year, so that was pretty inspiring. <laughs> and I photographed the whole, the whole thing. Um, you know, there's there's pictures of thank you. <laughs> um, I, there's pictures of me photographing Corbin coming down the aisle. Um, so there, you know, that was that was good. Uh, I'll tell you, you know, if if you want something a little bit more documentary, um, I teach workshops in um, in Darjeeling in India. So students come along and um, and what what they do is we go and stay with with um, on tea estates, Darjeeling tea, tea estates, and we stay with families and photograph their daily life. And every time I go to these, I go about three times a year, and every time I go, it's just the most inspiring thing. It's like going home. I love it. I love it. Do you follow photojournalism documentary ethics with NGOs? Yes. Um, I never, like I said before, my ethics are pretty simple. I don't, I don't crop or manipulate pictures um, at all. Um, and let me just, uh, let me just, people are asking. So, um, and I never photograph anybody in a situation they wouldn't want to be photographed in um, by themselves. I'm not a photojournalism, so I, a photojournalist, so I don't have to chase the story or the front line. I just have to spend time with the family. Um, so the ethics is I never photograph anybody in a situation I wouldn't want to be photographed in myself. The only exception to that um, is if the subject asks me to. Um, you're welcome, Jill. Let me see. I travel to Maine, Florida, and Pennsylvania during the year visiting family. When you are in a new place, what do you think is most important to make sure you photograph? Hmm. You know what? If you look at my website, um, I hope that you kind of get a sense of the mood of my photographs. That's what you want to photograph is the mood of a place. You don't want to photograph, you know, if you're in Paris, any picture you make about Paris, any picture you make in Paris will be about Paris. So you don't necessarily have to make a photograph of the Eiffel Tower. There's plenty of postcards. But get pictures of how you feel, your point of view, the mood of a place. Um, that's the most important thing to photograph wherever you go. And if you can do that, if you can get your own personal voice going, then you can photograph. Um, you can photograph wherever you want, and still have it be photographs that are made by you. Thanks, Stephen, for saying I gave good advice tonight. Miss any? Um, thank you, Danielle. You guys are great. You're all. Thank you very much. Um, any other questions? Does anybody have any answers for me? <laughs> um, this is a nice little presentation. I. Um, uh, 42, <laughs> Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. <laughs> um, thank you for sharing your insights. You're very welcome. Um, thank you, Alan. I, I've enjoyed giving the presentation. Love the dog. Yeah, he's cool. You're very welcome, Christy. Thank you very much, Mary. Thanks, Liz. <laughs> thank you. Thank you all. Well, I, you know, I'm, I'm here to help. Um, thank you, uh, Jean. Jean, Jean. Um, I'm here to help. I, when I was getting started, nobody, nobody would really answer any of my questions. Um, and uh, you know, I think that the work that um, the work of a photographer, if somebody hires somebody other than me, it's because they were better for the job. And um, and it's just important that this these stories get out there and and. Um, and that we help each other. That's that's what it's all about. Um, so, so um, I'm glad to help anyone, anyone out there. Um, <laughs> thanks, Stephen. You guys are wonderful, all of you. Thank you. Um, any other questions? All right. Well, that's terrific. And it's eight. It's in the East Coast. It's eight thirty-one. So I went only a minute over. Oh. Yeah, I hope I can come back again too. <laughs> Actually, a friend of mine teaches um, 
photojournalism at the Art Institute in um, Charleston, and I, um, by coincidence, I talked to his students um, uh, a few weeks ago, like three weeks ago, I think it was. I hope I can come back again too. But again, if any of you have any questions or, or um, you know, shoot me an email, and I can put you on my email list. I only send out an email about once every three or four months. Um, but I wish you all, all a lot of luck in uh, whatever you pursue. I really mean that. Um, so, anyways, thank you, Great. thank you, Ted. Thank you, Thatcher, so much for coming and giving this lecture. This has been really special for all of us, and not just the students, but also for the faculty too. I think. Well, you're. Thanks, Melanie. And yeah, positive wishes. That's what we, <laughs> we could all use those, right? <laughs> anyway. Well, everyone, have a wonderful evening. And thanks for um, taking the time to um, to hear me uh, jabber about my favorite thing in the world, photography and people. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Thatcher. You're welcome. Take care. Yep, you too. Bye-bye. <laughs>